Before we get started, today is a lecture on the brachial plexus and a few other nerves. Basically, it's the nerves lecture. We learn all the nerves that innervate the muscles that we've been talking about. Plexus means complex <laughs> network. All these nerves are they kind of mix and well, their anatomy has been studied. And the brachial plexus, let's remember what brachial refers to, the arm. Turns out the spinal nerve roots come out of the neck okay, to control the arm. Uh, Take a look at that picture. First thing, start with what you know. Do you see the spinal cord? Yeah. I heard one, yeah, maybe a few others. Yeah. And we see dorsal root, ventral root coming off of it. Here's spinal cord right there. It's an anterior view, so that's the uh, anterior medial fissure. We see the nerve roots coming off here. And um, we had um, dorsal and ventral rami. There's a small division here. It's hard to see. I put a line over it. But the posterior or dorsal rami are branching off. The anterior rami or ventral rami are kind of how we begin to teach this plexus. Um, so just to remind you, it's dorsal and ventral root, which merge to form spinal cord. I'm um, sorry. Dorsal and ventral root merge to form a spinal nerve. Then the spinal nerve divides into a dorsal ramus and a ventral ramus, colored in gray. So it's the ventral rami that are the um, first part of this plexus, the ventral or anterior rami. And what we see is there's five of them. That's why I have the big number five there in red. <laughs> Turns out, this is C5, this level. C6, C7, C8, comes after C8. T1. Yeah, correct. Not C9, right? Okay. So this is, uh, I guess, is the right side. And so at the level of C5, C6, C7, C8 and then T1. And we have Rami. Ventral Rami. So we have like C5 and C6, they kind of like merge together, as you can see in the picture. C7 is all by itself, and C8 and T1, they kind of merge together too. Okay, then, then the nerves, these ventral rami, they kind of um, form what are called three cords. It's all nerves, we just use different words. These are rami. Okay, I should probably put rami. I'm going to move this over for a bit so it's over the. I'm going to put this term all here. Ventral. Rami. Then these uh, five ventral rami, as you can see, some of them merge, and we're going to get three cords. Okay, nerves called cords. Let me use a different color. I'm sorry, they're not called cords, they're called trunks at this point. So, but anyways, there's three of them. And they're simply called upper trunk, middle trunk, and lower trunk. So there's three of them, and they're called trunks. Upper, middle, lower. My colors aren't really matching the picture, but I'm, I'm following this, OK, if you're trying to follow what I'm doing. I started with five rami. Let's see if you're with me. What are these called again? Trunks. And how many are there? Three. 
three, and that's not enough. You have to know which one's what. What one's that one called? That's the middle trunk. That's upper and that's lower. So it sounds like you're with me so far. Now stay with me. Those three trunks divide into six divisions here. That's what you're seeing there. Okay. That upper trunk is going to divide one division, it's each is going to divide into two. So this one trunk will divide into two divisions. One will stay anterior, but then one colored in blue is going to go uh, posterior there. Okay. So one stays anterior, I'll color it in green. And one goes posterior, I'll use blue. <coughs> yeah, so this one trunk became two divisions. One is anterior, one is posterior. <coughs> blue is posterior, little p for posterior, and a for anterior. Again, they call these this part divisions. And there's six of them. divisions. This middle trunk, again, will divide into two. One branch will stay anterior and one branch, one division will go uh, posterior. So one division anterior and one posterior. What I'll do is I'll um, match that. I'll try to make it be like this. Anyways, the blue one is posterior, anterior, and you can draw the same thing for the last trunk. One branch stays. Anterior, one goes posterior and it merges with the other two. <coughs> so I use different colors. So you can see I drew three that are posterior and three that are anterior. Um, anyways, six divisions. And what we get are three chords right there, one, two, three, okay? The way they merge and stuff, those six divisions form three chords. So I'll put another line here. <coughs> chords, there's three of them. two anterior divisions are kind of merging to form one chord there. <coughs> Just like that, so that's a chord. Notice that this posterior chord is formed from all of these divisions, which are all posterior. So that posterior division, that, that's a posterior chord. So that's the second of three chords. And then this simply is its own chord there. The 
the chords have names, um, and this is important, they're named according to their position relative to the axillary artery. Okay. This chord is posterior to the axillary artery. This chord is medial to it, and this chord is lateral to it. So you have medial chord and lateral chord. Now those three chords will form what are called five terminal branches. terminal branch means it basically is the branch that's going to go and innervate the muscle. Okay. So what you see here is that from this uh, lateral cord, it kind of like is forming this M with the other cords there. So let me kind of draw this out. Kind of get this sideways M. Uh, <coughs> let's see. Oh. Let's see. Okay, don't make this connect with that. I drew it kind of funky. Uh, this is posterior to the M. So here's my M, but this doesn't connect with it. Like I shouldn't have drawn it that far. This is like by itself. So let me number it so it's clear. So there's five things here. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. So the one, two, three are the three legs of my sideways M. The four and five are terminal branches of the posterior cord. Okay, now this is a better way to illustrate it. Now let me name the branches. And these are the names, you have to know the whole thing, but these are the names of the nerves that innervate the muscles. I have this next figure just completely unlabeled. And before I get into the names here, 53635. Three, okay, that'll help you remember. Five rami, three trunks, six divisions. Three chords and five terminal branches. You are expected to know that. And this figure is labeled if you want to kind of quiz yourself. My number one is the musculocutaneous nerve. For my terminal branches. I'm just naming them. Musculocutaneous nerve. Little n is an abbreviation for nerve. Uh, what I labeled number two is the median nerve. It's right there. Okay. Number three is the ulnar nerve. Right there. There's a pointing to the term on the figure. Four and five, the branches, terminal branches coming off the posterior cord. It's the axillary and the radial nerve. So that little branch coming off there is the axillary nerve. I called it number four here. And five, radial nerve. That innervates a lot of muscles that you're studying. 
we'll talk about that a lot today. So these five terminal branches innervate many. So the reason why they're called terminal is because, well, pretty much throughout the end, right, these are run throughout the length of the arm. Okay. For example, yeah, they all do. I mean, axillary doesn't go all the way down the arm. But pretty much, musculocutaneous goes about halfway down the um, arm, gets to the elbow, and all these other ones, they run all the way down here. So uh, there are other branches that branch off other places. We'll, we'll, we'll get to it. But this is pretty much all that's usually presented when you introduce uh, the brachial plexus. <laughs> Now, to give you some more anatomy, I, I kind of put these two images next to each other. And what you're seeing here is how the rami emerge out of the neck. And um, here are the cervical vertebra up here. You can see the rami, they're emerging out of um, two neck muscles called the scalene muscles. Now, these are muscles that are on your study list, but you should know them in terms of the, the, them being a landmark. Okay. Usually when I see the nerves pop out of there, I look for the anterior and the middle scalenes because I know the nerve roots uh, that control the arm come out of the neck. So and you can see how they're superior to the clavicle. You also see how when you get down to the axillary region that the cords are right here and they're positioned around the axillary artery. So it's an important anatomy there. So. I'm going to erase this. Anatomy landmarks are important. I think I mentioned this idea before. You try to find something, you know something else is next to it when you're dissecting a cadaver. You know, once you see the landmark, you say, oh, hey, I'm going to find what I'm actually looking for. If you see the anterior scaling, you should see the brachial plexus emerge out of it. So the anterior scaling muscle. Use it as a landmark to locate the ventral rami. The other thing you can see, the anatomy is, part of the brachial plexus is superior to the clavicle. Then the brachial plexus actually enters the arm by going through the axillary region. And the other anatomy I want you to know is, by the time you get down to cords, the cords are positioned around the axillary artery, obviously in the axillary region. Plexus um, are in the axillary region. And I said this, I don't know if I wrote it, let me write it. I'm sure. And are named according. their relative position around the artery. Uh, 
as we just said. There's posterior, medial, and lateral cords. So the axillary region, you're now inferior to the clavicle. All right. So in addition to, I'll let you copy that down. So on the diagram I just erased, there are some nerves that branch off um, other parts um, of the brachial plexus that are called supraclavicular branches, because they're branching off the brachial plexus superior to the clavicle, supraclavicular. The branches give students a headache. It's, it's a bunch of names you got to know, a bunch of muscles you got to memorize. It's the essence of anatomy. It's like, let's pretend a branch is a freeway. Freeways are great. Don't they get us to where we need to go? But what if you never get off the freeway? You're not getting to where you need to go. You're just getting close, right? So it's important to know the, the branches are like getting off the freeway and innervating the muscle. Okay, this is why we study them in anatomy. And so these three branches, the dorsal scapular, uh, suprascapular, and the long thoracic, all innervate muscles that we know. So they're illustrated here, but let me show you the other pictures. This atlas has really good pictures of these branches. So what I'll do is I'll list the nerve, and I'll list the muscle that it innervates. starting to get a clue of where to look for it. Scapular? I think you know what the scapula is, yeah. Superscapular nerve. Long thoracic. Nerve. Then I'm going to write over here, uh, muscle innervated. And we learned, well, it was the last test, the different types of nerve function. We call it somatic motor if it's one where you innervate a muscle and make it contract, right? So this is all somatic motor function. These nerves, they do have sensory function too. I mean, what's the kind where you, you feel your skin? Remember what that's called in the last test? Somatic something? Sensory. Somatic sensory, okay. There is somatic sensory function too. I'm not gonna talk about that except for one nerve. I'll try to make it easy for you, just one nerve. The radial nerve. Now I'm gonna show you a video on how the cutaneous function can be um, disrupted. I'm going to decide to now somatic sensory function. You know, we'll talk about that for radial nerve. We'll get to that later. But for now, just you know, a muscle just innervate. Let's see, okay. The dorsal scapular nerve innervates rhomboids. You see the picture there?
major and minor. So you can just put rhomboids, and it's understood as both of them. And what you're seeing here is the nerve comes off the brachial plexus. And most nerves, they go underneath the muscle to be protected. Okay, so they illustrate it underneath the muscle there. So there's the nerve exposed. See it go underneath the rhomboids. Here is suprascapular nerve. And I see two muscles there. Boom, boom. Supra infraspinatus. The long thoracic nerve. So it is anterior. Um, this is an exception here. The anatomy is the long thoracic nerve is on top of the muscle. It's not deep to it. It's on top of it. So that's an exception there. Okay. That makes it more prone to damage, actually. And I'll show you a case of what happens when you damage that nerve. In general, if you damage any of these nerves, don't you lose the function of the muscles they control? And then that can cause problems. All right, well, let's move on. Okay, moving on from um, supraclavicular branches, uh, the branches of the posterior core. Okay, so we have short branches, subscapular, thoracal, dorsal, and then these branches. The, I already mentioned them because they're some of the terminal branches, the axillary and radial nerves. All right, so this first short branch, um, it's in the scapular region. The name of the nerve is subscapular nerve. There's many subscapular nerves, plural. Let's just call it subscapular. Because the branches of the subscapular nerves are innervate two muscles that we'll study, subscapularis and the teres major, yeah, these muscles. <laughs> And they're called sub because if this is looking at it from an anterior view, normally you would get to it in a posterior view, and these would be sub or underneath. So subscapularis teres major, innervated by subscapular nerves. Lucissimus dorsi means widest of the back. The name of the nerve that innervates it is the thoracal dorsal. Here's your. Um, shoulder muscle, the deltoid. The deltoid, as well as the teres minor, are innervated by the axillary nerve. What I want you to see is that if you look at the axillary nerve, this is an anterior view. If you look at a posterior view, there's a space called quadrangular space. 
So what I did was I put these side by side. On this picture here on the left, you can see the axillary nerve with an artery called posterior circumflex humoral. Right there, they emerge together out of this little quadrangular space. Okay, so let me kind of draw that there around. So I just drew the space, this little green space between these muscles here, the teres minor, superior border, teres major, inferior border, and then medial and lateral would be the heads of the, bice or heads of the triceps brachii, long head. Uh, well, actually, that's kind of more or less humerus, too. Yeah, we'll say humerus. So this wall, humerus, this wall, the triceps brachii, the long head, Inferior border, the teres major. Uh, this top head, this top order there is the teres minor. And the name of the artery that came out was posterior. Circumflex humeral artery. I won't ask you about the artery, that's for 431. I will ask you about the nerve, axillary artery. I'll use green. This is right around surgical neck. So if you fracture the surgical neck, we are concerned about damaging these two structures. So I'll just put surgical neck. Remember, that's one of the necks of the humerus if you've forgotten your bones. But anyways, that's important in anatomy because I said the surgical neck is prone to fracture and if you damage those structures, you can lose a lot of function and a lot of blood. If you have a fracture there and the patient's, oh, I can't move my arm, doc. I can't move my shoulder. Well, you know, the doctor, they know how to test for these things. Uh, another nerve, well, uh, before I move on, any questions on the quadrangular space? So I'm going to um, label this quadrangular. I don't want to go too fast. So know that space because it's clinically significant. You can fracture a bone to damage those things. Okay. But I do want to move on to the radial nerve. We're going to follow the radial nerve all the way down the upper extremity. travels, it's going to go to an area that's in the posterior arm area, okay? <coughs> so call this radial nerve, I don't know, call it course of the radial nerve would be a good thing to call it. When it gets to the posterior forearm, The 
muscle it innervates triceps. Again, just to make sure you're with me. It's a muscle, is that motor or sensory function? Motor, very good. It's gonna go all the way down the arm. It's gonna to get to um, the lateral elbow, right around here. Mm -hmm. And when it does, um, well, they show you supinator. I should probably add that to that list. The supinator, brachioradialis, that innervates those muscles when it gets around here. I will show you a YouTube clip not too long from now. And, uh, the renal nerve has been damaged. Uh, one of the ways you can damage it, I'm not talking about myself, okay? If you drink a lot at night and fall asleep in your chair with your arm over the back in some funky way, you can compress that nerve. And the nerve compression can, can damage it and you lose function of part of your arm muscles. And it's called the radial nerve palsy. Sometimes people call it Saturday night palsy because typically a lot of people drink on Saturday night. Compression of compression of the radial nerve, and you lose some motor and sensory function. Usually, it's temporary, depending on the degree of compression. Compression up. Let's see here. <clears throat> radial nerve. Temporary. Loss of motor and sensory function. And later on, I'll show you a YouTube clip of a patient presenting that. And as I talk about these muscles, think about if you want to make sure the nerve is okay, test the muscle function. So for example, how are you gonna test for if the triceps is working? What does the triceps do? Extend what? Elbow, right? So it's just like, I'm testing myself. Okay, extend, uh, uh, and, you, and you resist their extension. You see how strong they are, okay? And if they can extend with a lot of strength, you say, oh, that muscle's working. Well, the nerve isn't damaged there. Well, let's go down further and see where the damage is. And let's say, oh, okay, um, these muscles. Um, well, let's say, for example, brachioradialis. How are you going to test that strain? Well, you have to know what it does. I said flex in mid-pronation. So I have the patient go like this, and then, okay, try to flex. And then you fight them and see how strong they are. And try on both sides, okay, because maybe they're kind of, you know, maybe that maybe it's an elderly person. They don't have that much strength to begin with. But if you compare the normal side, um, you, you can start to test for muscle function. We'll see that in the video. Okay. And keep that in mind as I go through the radial nerve here. I'm going to move on. You go from lateral elbow. When you get to the brachial radialis, the, it's way down here. The muscle is deep. Excuse me. The nerve is deep to the muscle here. Now you're going to go to the posterior forearm. <coughs> In the posterior forearm, well, as you well know, you just quizzed on it, or maybe you don't know, um, based on the quiz, you tell yourself how much you know and how much more you need to study. You went through a lot of muscles, and it's a lot, a lot to know. I know it's very difficult to take your time with it, but 
remember your practical is Monday. And what this picture shows you is all of these muscles being innervated by the radial nerve in the posterior forearm. I don't want to list them all again. We've been talking about it. extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis, extensor carpi ulnaris, abductor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis brevis, extensor pollicis longus, extensor digitorum. I have these two in parentheses. Um, extensor digiti minimi, um, I did teach, right? Yeah. But I didn't teach extensor indices, so don't worry about that one. Okay. I'll just say, on my board notes, extensors. Of wrist and digits. Okay, radial right nerve does a lot. So we're going to go back up the brachial plexus, get some other branches. These are the short branches. They branch off the medial and lateral cords. Basically, just no pectoral nerves. The name should tell you the muscles that they're going to innervate. Basically, they innervate pectoralis major, pectoralis minor. Cutaneous nerve muscles. The nerve is named because it has motor function, helps you move your arm. The cutaneous is sensory function. But we're not learning the sensory function for this nerve. It helps you feel your arm. Anyways, the three muscles are listed there. The corpus brachialis, biceps brachii, brachialis, all, all of your arm muscles there. Cloaco brachialis, biceps brachii. And brachialis. In a nutshell, these muscles flex arm and they flex forearm. They have big arm muscles there. The median nerve is formed from lateral roots, but, uh, well, let's just kind of get to it. The median nerve innervates all of these muscles here. I put some muscles um, names in black and in red. So these here, the pronator teres, the flexor carpi radialis, palmaris longus, flexor digitorum superficialis. Um, these four are more superficial. These three are in that superficial layer. The FDS is in that intermediate layer. Okay, it's shown right here by itself. These three have been cut off. These ones are in the deeper compartment. The pronator quadratus, 
is one you gotta know. Okay, these other two, I, I listed them, but they weren't on your study list, so I won't hold you responsible for them. So, let me list these here. Tornado carries. So I'm gonna erase these top ones so it doesn't look confusing. Pronator Terries, Flexor Carpi Radialis, Palmaris Longus, and the FDS. I'll just abbreviate it here for brevity, but. I expect students to know how to spell it out on a test. In the deeper compartments, the only one you gotta know is the pronator quadratus. <coughs> if you've been studying our models in the classroom, um, that one isn't shown. But don't worry, I'll find something that shows it. So study the pictures. It may be on your uh, lab practical on your exams. Okay, the last nerve here is the ulnar nerve, and it innervates muscles on the ulnar side. The flexor carpi ulnaris, you gotta know. It innervates half of flexor digitorum profundus, but again, be happy it's removed from your study list. You don't have to know that part. But this muscle, you gotta know. So on the ulnar side, and then it's flexor, carpi, ulnaris, the ulnar nerve. I'll write it up here. that innervate uh, muscles that we've been talking about. So these are not of the brachial plexus. This nerve is actually a cranial nerve. Cranial nerves emerge from the base of the brain. And this one, because I taught the trapezius, um, know the accessory nerve. I'll teach the sternocleidomastoid later, it's a big neck muscle, but the muscle I taught for this unit was the trapezius. And the nerve is cranial nerve 11. Now the cranial nerves have those Roman numerals. They have numbers, but they also have names. You need to know both. The number is 11, cranial nerve 11, but the name is the full name is spinal accessory nerve. Because it has access to spinal nerves. It's a cranial nerve that has access to spinal nerves. So hence the name spinal accessory nerve. You can just call it accessory nerve. Know that it innervates trapezius. And one other muscle I didn't mention in the lecture, but uh, because there's nerve roots from the cervical uh, region, that I talked about the brachial plexus today. This nerve is the phrenic nerve, and it has nerve roots from C3, C4, C5, and they form a nerve called phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve innervates, goes all the way down to the membrane between chest and abdomen. It's called the diaphragm. It's your breathing muscle. And 
when we talked about the diaphragm before, there's a picture of C3, 4, and 5. They merge to form phrenic nerves. They go um, outside the pericardium, along the heart, and they get to innervate the diaphragm down here. But they start way up here because there are breathing centers from that part of the nervous system, the central nervous system. And um, know the phrenic nerve and uh, know the diaphragm, the breathing muscle. So in terms of nerves, that's it. But I do want to start to get into some application for all the things that we've been talking about in this first unit. Uh, some joint and nerve problems, and I'll just highlight, there's a million things you could do, but I'll highlight a few common ones for you to be responsible for. One is a, called a wrist fracture or Collie's fracture. of the distal radius. And maybe the ulna too. The ulna, question mark. It depends how bad you fractured it. Uh, here, here's a picture of how it could happen. Just fall on your hand as so. And if you fracture the styloid process of the radius in an x-ray, you could um, identify the fracture by not just the broken bone, but pay attention to um, the styloid processes of the radius and the ulna. They're at the same level. You can see the fracture here. Maybe there's a fracture in this bone as well. They kind of line up. That's the abnormal thing. Usually they shouldn't be level. Usually The styloid process of the radius is distal to the styloid process of the ulna. But then if you fall and you have uh, fractures there and they kind of more or less line up, uh, that's one thing you can recognize on an x-ray. On an x-ray, styloid processes of radius and ulna align. Okay, that's the abnormal thing. That, that basically could confirm a fracture. Uh, I showed you this before, remember? When we talked about the elderly woman. This is another way it could, it could uh, show, not on an x-ray, you can just see that, right? Patient presents what's called the dinner fork deformity. They showed a, a, a fork on the previous slide there on the right. If you look at it uh, from the side like that, the fracture kind of makes the bones stick up and protrude, like turning a dinner fork um, upside down. Okay. Another joint problem could happen if you pay attention to the scapulothoracic joint. You see how the scapula lays on your back like that? Well, technically it's a joint called scapulothoracic joint. So 
know that. There's a picture of them right there. The problem we have is if you damage the long thoracic nerve, you lose the function of the serratus. of serratus anterior, that joint is going to pop out. But basically, it's called scapular winging. The scapula is going to pop out. That joint loses its integrity because the muscle can't hold it on to your back anymore. You might observe patient presents. Scapular winging. Let's remember that the scapula can rotate. And this shows movement of the scapular thoracic joint. And what we learn here is if you abduct a full 80 to 180, 120 of that is the abduction of the arm, but 60 of that is due to um, inferior abduction, I'm sorry, abduction of the inferior angle. Okay, that's what I'm showing you here. So this joint, you can abduct arm 180 degrees. Okay. However, 120 degrees is due to arm abduction. Um, and, and the rest, 60, is due to abduction of inferior angle. push against the wall and you have damage to the long thoracic nerve. Do you see how it pops out there? It's not working here. Hold on a second. Let me show you a clip of scapular winging. It's a little more impressive than the picture. Hang out for a second.
All right, check this out. Oh, wait, hold on. <laughs> I gotta make it look like this so you can see it. Look for the scapular wing. Left side looks okay, but look at the right side. Any movement, it just pops out of there. Okay. Is um, being double jointed a deformity too? I'm not sure what you mean by that because um, it just means to me a double joint it is the connective tissue for the joint is so stretched out you can just bend it in a funny way. Okay. There's, there's not two joints, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Is that what you mean by that? Sure, yeah. Yeah, but which one? <laughs> which joint? Um, like gymnasts? Like, you know how Ballyness? some people could just like put their leg over their head or something? Yeah, that just means the joint is less stable, so they can bend it far more than regular people. Yeah. The things that are holding it in there, muscles and tendons, they just stretch it out over time. So it's abnormally not stable. Okay. Yeah. But that is not that, the, the case we just saw, um, that I just showed you, the wing was very apparent. And um, this is a case study, but it's not, I can't call it an official case study, because it's just you two. But what she reported was, um, anyone ever walk on crutches? And you know how it kind of like rubs up in here? And that damaged the long thoracic nerve, uh, causing the winging. Turns out, later on, she got surgery to remove some scar tissue. And um, let's look at the same subject post-surgery. Tell me if you see an improvement. Pause it there. I think the surgery helped her quite a bit. I'm not seeing any. Well, I, I see some winging, but it's significantly reduced. I would say. All right. Okay, I'm gonna try to open up. PowerPoint slides again and do the next one. I don't know if she's in a lot of pain. She can't report that. Can you, can you uh, should you not be pulling up from that point on? Or like you're able to like pull up? Uh, I'd be scared to, yeah, for right. me. Uh, <coughs> if you lose the muscle of that function, and if you lose uh, that, if it's popping out like that, and it's not stable when you try to pull up or push really hard, you could damage other things. She was just moving around. It was just barely staying on there.
okay, a wrist draw, um, exactly what it is. You can't extend the wrist, it drops. So it's injury to the uh, radial nerve. Thing I alluded to earlier, the radial nerve palsy, where you kind of lose motor and sensory function. And so, um, for the loss of motor function, test the muscles, you know, triceps, brachioradialis, supination, extensors. Okay, and see what's damaged. That's muscle function. But also, test for nerve function. See if there's numbness in any of these regions. And depending on where the numbness is, you can kind of tell how far up, how far down the nerve compression is. Just presence or absence of numbness. One of the things that might present is wrist drop. Okay, where you have been an inability to dorsiflex or extend the wrist. On your half sheet, when I show you the clip, pay attention for a few things. Um, for the patient, they're going to assess triceps function. Now, what I want you to comment as well is. It, does it function or not? Okay, do they have triceps or not? Uh, brachioradialis. Supinator. All of those extensors of the posterior compartment. And also, they do ask about sensory. So I'll call this A, B, C, D, E. And uh, if you missed something on the video, you, you, you got the link. You could go back and watch it. The link is on the bottom of this slide, in case you're wondering. Now, let me queue it up. So we're going to do this video, it's a teaching video, we end, it ends up on YouTube, and you don't have any problem with it ending up on YouTube. You want your face blurred or, or not? You can blur you out I can blur you out. Yeah. Okay, we'll do that. So, um, do you want to tell the story of, of, of what happened to you? I had a couple drinks and what, fell asleep watching TV sitting up on the sofa. Don't really remember where my hand was when I fell asleep. Um, and when I woke up, it was doing doing that. 
And I didn't notice it really until I went on the computer and was trying to use the computer. When were you on the computer? At when I woke up. Okay, in the middle of the night. Well, no, it was uh, whatever time I woke up. Early morning hours? It might have been midnight. Okay, okay, so, but you went to use the computer and what did you find? That it was, uh, my hand was not working. Okay. And then I, I did my little test, you know, let's say smile. Somebody had just sent me that email too. I did the smile, I stuck out my tongue, and I thought, this is going to go away in the morning. So I just went okay. to Yeah, so you were making sure you didn't have a stroke. Right. All right. And that, not, there was no other, nothing else. They, not my foot, not the, yeah. not the other hand. Very good. A very intelligent patient here. Yeah, All right. <laughs> okay, so Joe, you're going to you're gonna do the exam. We're going to okay. demonstrate. So what's your work in diagnosis? So what we're thinking we have here is a radial nerve palsy and possible compression of the spiral groove. Okay. All right. And uh, I think on physical exam we'll be able to show that that's what it is. Okay. Um, so first, I'm just going to have you do some basic movements on the arm. Can you raise your arms like this? So you'll see, like, I mean, her axillary nerve, everything's intact. Can you take your arm and now flex it? Okay, can you extend it? Okay, hold your arm out for me and take your hand and just pronate it like that. So her pronation is, is intact. Okay. And then can you supinate it for me? Okay, and her supination is, is intact, but does it does it feel a little different when you supinate? Like, do you I, have any? I'm feeling this muscle. Okay. What we're going to try now is we're going to test the uh, for brachioradialis weakness. Okay. Uh, radial nerve intermixed the brachioradialis muscle. Um, can you hold your arm like this and then press up against my hand? So we did this test earlier, and it seems that she actually doesn't have much weakness in her brachioradialis. Okay. Um, now, as you'll see, when I hold her hand up like this, she actually has wrist drop. And okay. Now try and try and we'll put both hands up together. Uh, bring the other one over there for the camera, and now raise both wrists up. Flex both, yeah, dorsal, okay. okay. So you're, you're unable to do that with this hand here? Yes, can't do it with the right hand. Now what about extending the fingers? Can you um, extend those fingers at all? Okay, all right. Um, and you'll, you'll, you can actually click, now make a fist. Able to make a fist. now. Hey, Chick, compare her grip strength, though. Go ahead yeah. and put both fingers now and, and compare that. Squeeze as hard as you can. Grip strength is, is uh, significantly decreased. It, it is. It is. That's what I found on my exam. Now, have her do abduction of her thumb. Okay. Can you can you take your thumb? Uh, it's like that now. Can you move it like this? What about with the other hand? Yeah. So, no okay. So let's put both hands, both hands together. Now, let's try and abduct that thumb. That's as much as you can do. Yep. Okay. Now, what about sensory loss? You want to you want to go over that, yeah. Joe? Um, now you told me earlier that you have some abnormal sensation in the dorsum of your hand, mm -hmm. arm right here, and then in the in the dorsum of your hand. But we're we're going in. But you have normal sensation. Pretty much yeah. here on the palm. Okay. I want her to flex her elbow. Flex it. Now I want you to have her push you away with that. And what's your assessment of strength? I'm going to compare. A little bit stronger on the left side. But her triceps are definitely intact. Not, uh, yeah, definitely intact. Yeah. So, no diminished tricep strength. So what nerve is it then that on the wrist, put, go ahead and put your hand back down, uh, what, what, what innervates this area right here? Hi Dr. Penny, how are you? <laughs> so this is radial nerve. So that's going to be your superficial radial nerve branch. And, then, um, is, uh, and, and people with handcuffs will sometimes get damaged to that, and they'll just have numbness. So it's a sensory nerve that comes out there. But you said her, her numbness actually goes from here all the way up. Is that right? It's a neuropraxic injury, which means that the nerve is, is it, it's, it's, it's intact. It's just that it's been damaged by from the pressure, and it'll heal. Will heal by something called axoplasmic flow of protein to pass down, and that when it does heal, the sensory will probably come back before motor, so you start to feel tingling, burning. Some folks find it unpleasant, dysesthesias, but that will pass. And then, of course, the motor, and then, of course, you've got to try to work with it, and therapy is going to be important. 
So we're talking months as opposed to. Do so you think it could be six months? Yeah, three to six, I would think. Okay. Yeah, depending on the degree of neuroproxic injury. Anything else? The good news, it'll come back, but it's going to take some time. Okay. Dr. Penny's a neurosurgeon. Uh, that's good. what the nurse said. Oh, yeah. So he also, uh, really he's, like, today. he's also an emergency medicine doc, so. We're blessed that we can capture all this because it's a nice teaching tool. Yes. Yeah. Nice, that goes around your thumb. Okay, and then this one. Oh, they just don't let me get it too tight. So you were, you were saying you were trying to pay bills and use your left hand to, to uh, operate the mouse? And and that's when you kind of and you were actually trying to pay bills because you were you were thinking I wasn't, that if, I didn't know if, what if this was happen. a stroke or something like that you need to have those bills paid. Yeah. Okay, Larry Millman, pretty good. Talk about that a little bit. I've watched that video clip uh, for many years now, and uh, I always learn something new uh, every time I watch it. So I asked you to assess supinator. What'd you put for that? Was she able to supinate? Yes. Yeah. But was she able to supinate with supinator? The answer is no. When she supinated, she said, "Remember, she pointed. Oh, it's all, it's all here. I feel it here. What muscle was this?" The biceps brachii. Doesn't the biceps brachii also supinate? So she was able to supinate because it was the biceps brachii, but supinator wasn't helping her. So she did not have, supinator was gone. Okay. Did she have triceps brachii function? That was intact. Yeah. So it's like, okay, so the nerve compression probably wasn't up here, it was probably down further. <coughs> Supinator's down there. Did she have brachioradialis? Yeah, she had that for the most part, so that branch was okay. For the most part, what did you say the extensors were gone? Did the patient present wrist drop? Yeah, yeah. yeah and they even tested move. Why, why did they test thumb movement? Because it's all radial nerve. Okay. And she, could she do it? No, she couldn't. She couldn't do anything with her finger. She couldn't use a keyboard. Um, it's interesting to see how the patient figures out something's wrong couldn't use the mouse. You know, that's when I figured out it wasn't working. I tried to pay my bill because I'm having a stroke. I don't want my bills over. I mean, um, oh, I'm sorry. This says sensory, not scenery. Sensory. Did she lose any sensory function? Yes. Yeah, but not in the palm. She lost some. I think she said there was some weakness, um, some numbness in the dorsal. Um, okay, well, anyways, I think that's a great clip for students to see. Um, so in that kind of analysis, I want to say full sensory or partial? A partial. Yeah, I mean, there is numbness not everywhere, but in some locations. I think it's just good for you to, a good takeaway from that is, um, oh, this is messing me up. A good takeaway from these videos is it teaches students that you have to know the language of anatomy to function in your job, okay? Do you remember when uh, the doctor asked the med student, okay, what branch is that? And he kept saying radial nerve. You know there are branches of the radial nerve that I'm not teaching you. You can't just say radial nerve. It branches on all these different branches, and Dr. Malik says, oh, it's a superficial branch. And I'm not teaching you that, but if you're going to be a doctor, you got to know all the branches of the branches of the branches. Okay, that's what I'm saying. And if you're going to be a nurse or something else, you got to know it too. Because don't you want to understand what the doctors are saying? If it's me, I would. Okay. Or do you want to be a grease spot in the wall when the doctors are talking? I think you want to know what's going on, and you can really communicate with your patient better. So the difference in age, like a child or somebody that's an adult? No, I think if you compress a nerve at any age, you'll see the same result. I don't think the fact that she was older uh, was a contributing factor. 
to have a lear learning uh, clinical experience is really valuable. I'll share one experience with you. When I was a grad student at UCLA, I went to the student health center, and I had this cyst that I wanted removed, so they all had to look at it. It's a teaching hospital, but all these nurses, I, from like, I don't know, the lowest to the highest, I had like five different nurses or whatevers, they came in and looked at it for like 20 minutes, the last nurse who looked at it, I could tell she was the highest sen seniority person because she had the most stuff around her name tag. Uh, and she's looking at, I think it's this, I think it's that. And then the doc comes in, and he looked disheveled and overworked. And he just stands there from across the room, looks, and starts writing down. <laughs> and all the nurses are lined up against the wall. They're waiting for him to say what it is. He's not saying anything. He's giving them nothing. And finally, the nurse is like, well, what is it? And she goes, he goes, oh, yeah, it's this epidermal cyst. And they were all wrong. I was like, you guys were all wrong. Um, it made me realize that clinical practice, it's like, you just need to keep trying, okay? Because the doctor knew just from standing across the room, he's probably seen it a thousand times. But if it's your first time seeing it or second time seeing it, um, you're gonna, probably going to miss it, right? So... Um, but it, I think what we can learn from these experiences, uh, watching clips like this, is you have to keep going to work, right? If you've seen it once, you're probably going to mess it up. If you've seen it 20 times, if you've seen it 100 times, if you've seen it 200 times, you're going to be very effective. But you only get that with years of practice. So, for example, my experience was in like 15 years ago. How good do you think those nurses are now? they're probably so much better, okay? But you know, as you're learning, you, you might flub it up and that's okay, you just have to get back on the horse and keep trying. Um, all right, so um, the next injury is injury to the uh, AC joint. It's called the uh, AC joint separation. Now, I taught these ligaments before, okay? They're in your notes. And um, for AC joint separation, we're going to watch a clip. You're on your half sheet. Uh, what letter are we on? I think I did letters today. We're on F. I want you to note the ligaments that rupture in this separation. This is um, illustrated in the app, but uh, we're going to watch a YouTube clip of and get to hear the doc talk over. It's pretty interesting. Is there a closed caption on this video by any chance? I'll check. Clavicular. Here you see a model of the shoulder with some of the suspensory ligaments. The AC joint is going to refer to this joint here between the acromia and the clavicle. The AC joint does have ligaments termed the acromioclavicular ligaments, now highlighted in yellow. These, however, aren't the most important ligaments for this joint. Instead, it's the coracoclavicular ligaments located here. These ligaments connect the coracoid bone to the clavicle, and these are the most important for keeping that clavicle from popping up when a blow is sustained. Here we see multiple different angles of the shoulder girdle, from the back, the top, and the side, and the 
top here you see a nice view of the AC ligaments. Here's the clavicle, here's the acromion, and then below it here's the coracoid and the coracoclavicular ligaments are hidden down here. So here you see the AC ligaments highlighted, now the coracoclavicular ligaments. Well, how does this injury occur? It's usually a blow to the top of the shoulder. Here you see a soccer player who falls on the point of the shoulder. This would be a very common mechanism. Uh, also, it's very common in football, obviously, because football players are routinely taking a blow to the top of the shoulder. Now, in most cases, shoulder separations are treated conservatively, which means without surgery. And you hear about shoulder separations all the time. However, when the coracoclavicular ligaments and the AC ligaments are torn in a young active athlete, occasionally surgery is required. Here you see a clinical photograph of what it looks like when the AC joint is dislocated. People complain of a prominence on the top of the shoulder and really pain with any activities with that arm. Here you see a variant of the AC dislocation in which the clavicle is displaced posteriorly and this can be quite severe and painful. Well, how are we going to fix this? What you'll see in this video is we'll insert an angled arthroscope or camera, uh, position that underneath the coracoid, which is here, and then we'll use special techniques to pass a tightrope device, it's called, which is uh, two buttons, metal buttons with high tensile strength sutures between them. We're going to pass that device through the coracoid, through the space of the coracoclavicular ligaments, through the clavicle, so that when we tighten that down, it's going to pull the clavicle down, reducing the AC joint, and bringing the coracoclavicular ligaments into contact so that they can heal. So then if these ligaments heal, the patient's normal anatomy will be restored. The advantage of arthroscopic repair beyond just small incisions is that I get to look inside the joint and look for other pathology. Here you see we're looking at the rotator cuff, at the biceps, the cup of the shoulder, or the ball of the shoulder to make sure there's no other injury. Next what we're going to do is go into the subacromial space on top of the rotator cuff and unroof the acromion, that bone that I spoke of earlier. That allows us to visualize the coracoacromial ligament seen here, and then we can follow that ligament down, which is not injured, to the level of the coracoid. Once we remove the soft tissue, we're able to see the undersurface of the coracoid. This is where we're going to be putting our tightrope device. Below me there are some neurovascular structures that we're going to be very careful of. Here you see the special guide coming into position on the animation that allows us to position a guide wire through the clavicle and in the center of the coracoid. Here you see the tip of that guide wire. Once we have that guide wire in position, really the surgery becomes fairly straightforward because now we can pass a system of instruments over that guide wire, such as this cannulated reamer. This is going to allow us to drill the appropriate size hole through the clavicle and the coracoid. Here you see me protecting the neurovascular structures by placing a curette underneath the tip of the guide wire so that it won't protrude further as I drill the holes. Once the reamer is in position, now I can remove that central guide wire. That allows us to pass a nitinol wire, which is a flexible wire. Here you see an animation of that going into place. That nitinol wire will be passed out one of our portals. Then I can remove the reamer. Here's a live video of that nitinol wire being passed, the reamer being pulled out. So now the nitinol wire can be used to pass our traction sutures from our tightrope device through the clavicle and the coracoid and out a portal in front of the shoulder. Now all that's left to do is to pull the tightrope device into position tension it so that the clavicle and the AC joint are reduced. Here you see that button coming into place underneath the coracoid. I'm using a tuning fork and other devices to help position it just the way I want it. And then you'll see on the split screen here as I pull superiorly we'll get that button to lock into place underneath the coracoid the way we want it. And then what we'll do is tension the sutures from above, as you see here, 
pulling that clavicle down into position and holding the AC joint reduced. There you see the button on top of the clavicle. Once we're happy with the tension and the reduction, we'll go ahead and tie those stitches down. Confirm that the AC joint is reduced on x-ray and then the repair is complete. And as you can see, we use fairly small incisions compared to the very large incisions of the past. Well, what does that look like on x-ray? Here you see an AC dislocation. The clavicle is clearly riding well above the acromion. Here you see the coracoid. The distance between the coracoid and the clavicle is also increased. This is something that we routinely measure when we're looking at x-rays. And then you see after surgery with the tightrope button in position, uh, of course you can't see the ligaments where the stitches on x-ray, but you can see the buttons that are associated with it, squeezing the clavicle down towards the coracoid, reducing the AC joint. Let's look at that again. Here it is with the AC joint dislocated, and now with the AC joint reduced. In summary, most shoulder separations are treated without surgery. However, advances in sports medicine now allow minimally invasive treatment of AC dislocations when surgery is required. Oh, you've had that surgery. Did they ever remove the buttons? I don't know. I just have, I only went once. Okay. I have like a big scar that goes from here to there, and then I have a bunch of little ones hmm. around. You uh, set off metal detectors? <laughs> no. Okay, okay. good. <laughs> no, that's interesting. Did you fall on your shoulder? I uh, was playing basketball and I was saving a ball from going out of bounds oh. and I jammed it into a rock wall. Oh. Yeah. That'll do it. Yeah. Sorry to hear that. And I played football. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> shoulder separation. Okay, let me go back to that one of the slides. Well, anyways, the goal of surgery is to reduce the separation to allow the tissues to repair. Okay, that's the goal. If surgery is required, like you said, surgery is usually a not a last resort, but you don't want to do it unless it's very severe and severe um, separation. Reduce separation. doing so you allow ligaments to heal uh, one other common elbow injury in the throwing motion of a, say a baseball pitcher for example is a uh, the UCL ulnar collateral ligament UCL stands for Olar Collateral Ligament. And we're going to talk about a UCL reconstruction of that elbow ligament. The ulna is basically on the inside of your elbow. And now, uh, the surgery that's performed is commonly uh, called Tommy John surgery uh, for the first patient, baseball pitcher. First performed in 1974, the Dodgers. The team physician was Frank Job. Got a picture of him there. He reconstructed the UCL. He was a left-handed pitcher to show you his record, 288 wins. That's an awful lot. He received the surgery, and then he returned. And he performed pretty well post-surgery, so this is really important for sports medicine. You don't know you've had a career-ending injury unless you know you can recover from surgery and get back on the field. So that's why this was such an important case. So he won a lot of games post-surgery. Seems like everyone's getting it now. Um, what you do is for the anatomy part of this. It's a tendon graft. You use the tendon 
to replace the ruptured or sprained ligament. The UCL is shown, I showed it on a previous slide, I kind of zoomed past it, let me go back. I'm pointing to it in the red arrows. Okay, the UCL ligaments, elbow ligaments, it's on the inside of your elbow. In the throwing motion, those tend to wear out over time. Um, the MRI shows you need to replace it. What you can do is you can basically drill holes in the elbow and you can use a tendon of a muscle of the same person, of course, so there's no um, tissue rejection. The gracilis is used a lot. Sometimes they use the palmaris longus. And what you do is you have to go in there, you have to take out that muscle. And it's a very small muscle, so maybe the athlete doesn't need it very much. But there it is, torn. And if you drill your holes and use the tendon to kind of stabilize the medial aspect of the elbow, that that's what the procedure is. So what you got to know is um, use tendon of either gracilis or palmaris longus to reconstruct the UCL. I had a YouTube link there, but I think we watched enough YouTube for today. But I think you should watch it if you want to see it. And you are responsible to know about UCL reconstruction. Okay. Uh, so something I want to talk about before we take a break is um, your lab practical, which is coming up on Monday. time to set up in the morning. So um, for you guys, it'll be a little later start time, uh, 9 a.m. Because I need to set it up. And I'll try to set it up starting Friday, but I'll, I'll still need time in the morning. And it's so early, I mean, I can't get here at 4. But, uh, but anyways, be warned. Don't get inched out of parking. I know you guys used to get in here and you have plenty of parking, but at a later hour, parking may not be available. So don't get here at 8.57 and not have a place to park. That's not an excuse to be late, okay? <laughs> 